Yeah, we've got some spawn, so let's start it up. Okay, um, welcome to the public school committee meeting. Uh, we are being recorded. If anybody else is recording, please let us know so that we have record of it. Uh, we're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Flags to my left. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're going to straight from the agenda just briefly here. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bayetta. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'd ask that the uh, committee and the public that's here tonight join me in a brief moment of silence for the recent passing of our kindergarten student, Ariella Rose de Rocha, who tonight is awake, is 48, and is being buried tomorrow morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, first up on the agenda, we have the vote to approve the minutes of September 23rd, uh, 2021, both open and executive session meetings. Has everybody had a chance to look those over? Yes. Yep. Are there any corrections or comments? No, no. no. Seeing that, oh, uh, I apologize. Uh, before we continue, I do want to, for the record, state that uh, Mrs. Kathleen Stern is actually joining us via Zoom, so she is present as well. Um, sorry, back to the meeting minutes now. Um, seeing no questions, comments, or criticisms, I would entertain a motion to approve both the open and executive session um, minutes from September 23rd, 2021. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Mrs. Stern? Yes. Mrs. Gallagher? Yes. Mrs. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Sheehy? Yes. And Mr. Savas is yes. <clears throat> All right. Next up is the warrants. I reviewed and approved the following warrants. School expense warrant, September 21st, 2021, $473,026.29. October 7th, 2021, $432,721.18. School payroll warrant, September 23rd, 2021, $1,218,253.40. And October 7th, 2021, $1,093,830.02. Uh, I wish to enter them into public record. Thank you very much. Okay, next on the agenda is the student representative update. Do we have Zoe and Malia with us? Yep, we're here. Hi. <clears throat> um, so this week, we actually asked the principals to kind of get the kids to talk about how it's been um, transferring from hybrid or remote completely um, to now fully in person. And just kind of like what were the disadvantages if the, if there are any or um, mainly what how has teaching been different how has learning been different just kind of overall how are the changes and we've got pretty good responses um, I'll start with the LGN um, not very much on topic but they did get a couple um, they said I love getting to make new friends and playing with them during recess I like the teachers at the LGN I like that we are in person and that I get to see all my friends in class. I like all of it. <laughs> and I like that we have great choices for lunch and cafeteria. Um, it was a good one to add, but um, yeah, it's pretty positive over there. And Malia has the uh, next school, Yale, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so Mr. Kagan said that the benefits of in-person for them were being able to make and be with friends, uh, learn from the comfort of school, get to interact with others, get to have fun in school, uh, have the ability to be more creative in person than just being online with better projects and hands-on activities, uh, seeing everyone in the cafeteria at lunch and being able to play with everyone at recess. Uh, then for the disadvantages, they didn't really have much. They, <laughs> they kind of looked at me blankly and said, I don't know. <laughs> so it's a good thing. Um, 
how has learning changed since before COVID? They said it's gotten a lot harder. And when asked why, they said, well, everything is getting harder since last time I was in second or third grade. Um, so for fifth graders, they said that they now have two switch teachers, which is it's just too much. <laughs> it's, it's a lot to handle. Um, and they said that they looked at things from from the above in terms of benefits, more in-school projects, group work, fun activities, experiments, and fun. Uh, for the middle school, uh, they, the NMS STEP program just participated in Unified Bocce at Beckwith Middle School in Rehoboth, and it was a great day, with nine student athletes and four staff members attending, uh, Mrs. Sullivan, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Fitton, and Principal Hayward. And the team's next match is Wednesday, October 20th at Case Junior High School in Swansea, if you want to go support them. Uh, so that was it for the yell in the middle school. I think Zoe's going to go high school. Um, yep. So high school has a little bit more responses. Um, for the benefits of in-person learning, they mm -hmm. said, I seem to get better grades, less procrastination, easier to pay attention, more hands-on learning activities, and see teachers more. Um, for things that they miss from hybrid, they miss working from home, the staggered late arrival, um, the staggered arrival and late arrival. There was less traffic, which is a problem that student council is working on right now, <laughs> hopefully. Um, got to sleep in and stay at home some of the time and remote Mondays were great. Some disadvantages is that five days a week is tough <laughs> and waking up every day and that they're always at school but post COVID changes, a lot more online resources. Generally, teachers have been more flexible with deadlines. Some people say less homework, some people say more homework, and there is definitely a lot less paperwork. Um, but yeah, um, going back to how student council is working on the traffic, maybe, we also did a school-wide poll, and I think Malia has um, a little bit more information about that. Yeah, so we decided um, that we were seeing a lot of stuff that we were looking into, like what students were thinking about the high school from like the schedule changes and the traffic and just transferring back to in person. So I think like a week ago, right, a week or two ago, we sent out a poll just trying to cover, you know, what students want to kind of touch base on. So uh, we included things such as like, what do you do during LLB, which is like our, our study hall block, what do you use that time for? Um, during LLB, how much of the time do you use for school and how long should it be to meet your needs? Uh, what's your preference for the LLB? Because this year we switched to a schedule where we alternate between um, 10 and 30 minutes. So we're curious to see what kids think in preference having like a consistent time or the alternating schedule. And um, we talked about morning traffic to see how it's affected students because it's a pretty general thing that a lot of kids have impacted just getting to school on time and being late. Um, how many masks they get? And we also included a question just to talk about any other issues or things they might want to look at talking about. Um, so we didn't really work it into the like tonight's kind of report because we didn't really fully look at the results yet. But just um, that's something that we're looking at right now from the student council point of view. It's just trying to get more kids involved at the high school and having more stuff to say to you guys. So <laughs> yeah, that's um, something that'll be coming up once we can figure out kind of how to quantify the data a little bit more and figure out what we're going to do with it. But yeah, just wanted to mention that really quickly because I think I mentioned last time that we were going to be doing a poll and that's how it turned out. So yeah, I think that's it for us if Zoe doesn't have anything else to add. No, all good. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. I certainly empathize with the kid who didn't want to do five days a week. <laughs> Try to get that by my bosses and I don't quite, you know. <laughs> Uh, okay, next up on the agenda, we had the superintendent's revised goals for 2020 through 2022. Right, so these are a continuation of 2021, 20, 21, 22, so June. I gave you the action items with the update, um, the update of the continuation, and then resetting is some, a couple of the goals. Uh, the panorama student survey for grades 3 through 12 on school climate, parent uh, notifications are going out. Um, and then the health survey for 6 to 12, if you remember the health survey, that also requires a parental um, agreement. Those will be going out and those students will be taking that during the months of October and early November. The survey, the health survey will be collated as it normally is. Um, and then we get the graphs and we get the actual report. The panorama survey um, is the same thing. And 
Jen O'Neill, our assistant superintendent, will come back to you with uh, some of the things that we've learned um, from the data that we're um, seeing. And then those will be incorporated into the next plan, which really is aligning with um, my um, professional development plan in terms of putting together a plan about what are we what are we seeing in the survey. So, for example, if we see an increase in bullying being reported by students in the survey, then we should act on that through curriculum, through speakers, all of that stuff. Um, if we see uh, increase in marijuana usage, for example, it's legal in Massachusetts, but it's illegal for children and on school grounds, then um, how is that how is that happening? All of it um, on the health survey is 100% anonymous. We do not take any tracking whatsoever. Um, so it's, it's, it's literally building what you think. Um, the panorama can be done in multiple ways through actually looking at individual students to create um, students who are saying that they don't feel connected to school, for example, which is one of the questions that we learned um, pre-COVID that we did with the students is that we had bodies of students that didn't feel that they were felt connected to school on a daily basis. That's good information to have either as a group from grade three or to then track it individually. That becomes part of the panorama platform, which actually keeps track of their grades, their discipline, their self-reporting, um, and their attendance. And then it shows up as a marker for us to work with kids. That all of a sudden, we start to see grades going down. The marker might show a yellow or a red, meaning they're on task or on grade level, et cetera. So um, we've had really good success with preemptive strikes. And again, it's controlled, it's controlled um, by parents. If they don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. And that's by state requirement, by the way. So that's um, that's on there for uh, your information, and um, you'll get a report in probably December, January on some some items, and then early spring, and then we'll wrap it up by. Typically, we go into the first meeting in September, so that I can put it all together over the summertime. But my goal is to get it to you to the June school committee meeting as much as possible. One clarification here yeah. on, on goal one. So is that a completed goal or is that a completed and revised goal? That's a, that? So that's a that's a um, completed goal. Um, I have some data to share with you in terms of the evaluations and stuff, um, and I'll get that to you. Okay, so no that. revision. That's just great. Right. Exactly. And that was, if you remember, we used four four goals for teachers last year. All administrators. Those four goals, what we completed because we were such in an awkward teaching and learning situation with the hybrid model until March. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments on that? All right, we'll move right along to item number five. That's grades PK through 12 enrollment update. All right, so you'll see that you have two sheets with you tonight. Um, the, um, both of these are reflective of what is typically done in Massachusetts, which is, which is we report according to our internal data from October 1st. It's actually been extended this year um, because they want us to take a look, by us, I mean public schools, look at the number of students who are um, socioeconomically struggling um, and spend more time uh, figuring that out, if you will. But you'll see that our district enrollment um, overall, this would be um, students that are in district, students that we provide services to out of district, school choice enrollment, reads, which is part of our, not part of our enrollment, but part of being here with us, is a total of 2,458. The prior year was 2,454, we're actually um, up overall four, we're down six in district enrollment. Um, the positive one is the out of district number. You'll see went from 44 students out of district to currently 32, but I will tell you and growing. Um, we're probably gonna see a, a number of getting closer to 40 before the end of the year because of um, special education needs during the IEP process that takes place. And we have an increase of 23 students in school choice up from 163 to 186. I mean, out of district numbers are always going to be variable. Yeah, the out of district it, it's it's based on the team, the parent, the team coming together using the data and the best process. If it cannot be done um, in a least restrictive environment within the school system, and then students can go out, and then we we cut the tuition costs, the services costs, including transportation. Refresh my memory. Do we have a cap on school choice? Uh, we have a cap. Uh, we closed choice September 1 for your vote. Um, we had no cap at the middle and high school, and I believe we had caps of 5 um, and 10 throughout. And that didn't count siblings. 
Uh, any, any thoughts on those caps? Well, we to be quite honest, because of coming back from COVID, I'm actually kind of happy or coming back from the models that we've been in. I'm kind of happy that we don't have um, classrooms with 26 and 27 kids at the elementary level. I'm, I'm elementary level classes at the Yale rough, are roughly around 22, 23, which is actually lower than usual. Some of those might change just because of the service delivery model, special education with inclusion um, at the el early elementary grades during really good shape around 22 and it's low as 18 in the uh, kindergarten class of 18 and 19, which is what we prefer. And that was due to the hiring of that teacher through the savings that we made, which became a priority during the summertime. So we've seen some numbers go with the LGN. Um, so I, I would say um, what we did for this year was a good idea. I think we look at it again next year. Um, one of the things that's really interesting, not in these numbers, um, is that 52 students are currently Homeschool. That's double what we normally get. Um, and that has a number of different reasons. As you know, the homeschooling decision is one that's a very private decision. As a district, we can't ask too many questions. All we do is review the curriculum that is going to be provided and sign off on it and go through that process. Um, so we could have actually seen an increase in our local um, um, student body, meaning in district student body this year. We had a ton of registrations in the month of August. Um, and it hasn't basically stopped. We've been tracking our numbers every day. So this 24, um, this, this uh, 24 58, which encompasses everything, that's been pretty steady for the last two weeks. But the first three weeks of school, that, that went down to, up to, down to, up to. Um, we had some families that went from district to school choice because they bought a house out of town. So um, it's fluctuated a little bit. How do our numbers look for the alternative schools in the area, like charter schools, southeastern. So we don't have those numbers yet. Uh, we'll get those afterwards, but I think you'll see that both of those are pretty stable. High 80s, low 90s for, for the chart for the charter school has been where we've been for the last couple of years. I think you'll see, um, and we did have returning families again this year. And then the southeastern and the Aggie um, are pretty stable. They're going to roughly be in that mid 90 for southeastern, reaching 100, and then the Aggie. The numbers get into the less than 20, less than 12 some years really fluctuates. They are opening or have opened a brand new school at the Aggie. So yeah, you could see some drove flux. by that's a trigger. I was yeah, it's a beautiful yesterday. Building. So, so hundred million dollars that hundred million dollars that all of the towns are like paying for. I believe you have a I believe the town of Norton's cost is seventy thousand dollars a year every year for 20 years, not including tuition. Now in the event we don't place a child at that school, are we still on the hook for that? No, it's it's per it's tuition based per quarter. So student goes, you get charged. Student doesn't go, you don't get charged. So if they all of a sudden went from fifteen kids enrolled at the Aggie to thirty five kids, then you see an increase in tuition of probably well over or close to a million dollars. So I'm thinking about this right. School choice, we could probably absorb larger numbers at the JCS, the LG, and the Hay. But the way that we model a middle school would make it difficult to take them in going forward. In other words, we could add a teacher at the JCS or the LG, but adding one at the middle school is a little tougher because of the way it's structured. Yeah, so your middle, right. your middle school concept for teaching and learning is that you have two teams and then you have the content areas divided into those two right. teams. And so you a add a number on each side. Correct. So, so you have an English, math, science, social studies, yeah. the common core, and then you have your electives and, and your required PE health classes. So what happens is if all of a sudden you, you added, and, and we've done this in the past with AIA math and English and all of that, um, we didn't see some of the fruits of that, that labor over time. So that's one of the reasons why we went back to the more traditional model. Um, when it comes to the elementary, it's a straight. If you have 180 kids, and all of a sudden you have 100, you have 200 kids. You add another section, you're distributing the students, which is what we did with kindergarten. Right. Um, the only other issue, is though, that you know we have a lot of debates or views about the space in the buildings. I can tell you that the space is getting a little crunchy because you know once again we started another special education in, internal program at the LG that took up another space, which is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But if you're trying to open up another section, that becomes more of an issue um, of where do you start to move people around. Right? Any other questions on that? No? All right, let's move right along to the special ed.
So the, the special education enrollment update um, is again just taking a look at um, the total number of students that are receiving some type of services in the district, and that number is 546 of the total. Um, I think um, that's come that's come down since September. We track it every month. This is a student um, that's um, out of district, uh, a student that's getting itinerant services. For example, a homeschool student might be getting speech. That's on this count. Um, and it's not broken down by disability type um, because I always worry that that could actually communicate to a group of people, you know, staff members, the, the public uh, on who has a certain disability. And I don't think that's appropriate. But you will see that um, there's some areas where the total number of students in comparison to the enrollment uh, gets us pretty high. And, and I'll give you an example. Your fourth grade, current fourth grade, percentages is, is, you know, climbing to 30 percent. Now, a lot of that is those secondary services that are primary services for that student. So that would be your speech, your OT, your PT, um, and a lot of inclusion kids, but there are 94 uh, students getting specialized services. Um, and as you can see, those continue all the way through high school. Um, and we currently have three students um, that are over 18, but not yet 22. Um, and those are part of our uh, responsibility. Um, so that's kind of like the breakdown so that you can see. Um, and these numbers fluctuate more than any other number in the district uh, because meetings are taking place every day in all five schools around service delivery models. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, next up, we have the superintendent's report on pathway options. So we, as you know, pre-COVID, we started working on some of this. And during COVID, I um, back to, to March of 2020, um, we were spending a lot of time taking a look at different pathways for our students. Um, I'm a big, very big supporter of attending college, but I don't think that you have to attend college to be a successful um, community member in any community in, in, in Massachusetts. And so there are things that we need to start looking to do for students that provide them an option. So there are four here that we're working on. There's an early college, I'll go back and explain them a little bit. There's an innovation pathway, there's a career technical education or vocational, as some of you would call it. And then there's one that we're currently calling alternative education, but we wanna come up with something that's better than the word alternative because it places a, a label on it that I think is inappropriate. The early college has been the one we've spent a lot of time on. This is the opportunity starting as early as this spring for students at Morton High School to earn 12 to 18 college credits at UMass Dartmouth. Bachelor, uh, the Boston Architectural College is also going to be involved with this, and we're currently not ready to announce a private school, but we're going to be working with a private school. What's different about this approach is that it's different from dual enrollment. Number one, it's literally these courses count for both high school credit and college credit. So a student could earn 12 to 18 credits in, in, for example, the, the area of biology, they could check off two years of science first or one year of science at the high school, but literally transfer an entire semester to UMass Dartmouth or the UMass college system because they're, they use the same. Our partners that we're working with is UMass Dartmouth. We're also working on the funding source for that. What's different is that we are including high schools in the area. So we're working with uh, Oliver Ames and Easton, East Bridgewater, Mansfield, Taunton, Brockton. We're coming in um, with another school that's on there, plus Hanover, Attleboro Public Schools, and it's a growing list. The cohort model right now is that these classes would be a combination of hybrid and online after school hours and evening, because as you know, high school schedules are so different from place to place, trying to fix it. However, students could have a time period during the school day where they have a place to go and work on that course so that they're not just totally overwhelmed, especially if they're in the arts and sports after school or they're working after school. The innovation- um, So can I ask you, yes. so they would be taught by somebody from- They're being taught by UMass yes. uh, professors and or the potential that our staff could become UMass Mount, UMass Dharma uh, adjunct professors or other school systems, uh, high school teachers. And, and they're, they're learning at a college level. It's not a They're learning at a college level, the same material, but with a high school cohort of students. So instead of having a high school student take classes with a college student, it's high school students from the area taking the cohort together. And how does that work with their GPAs? Is it weighted differently? It'll, it'll be part of their um, 
AP process, so the same thing, because it is considered a college class. It's not taking a test to get credit for those colleges that accept credit that we all know is minimal, but it does work with the GPA, so it would work that way. Okay. You'll eventually be hearing about that, too. Um, the innovation pathway is a state application process. Jen and Ethan are actually doing that. Um, it's a pretty complicated process where we have to use local workforce needs. So we're in Bristol County, so we would have to use Bristol County information. Um, we have to work with our school for careers uh, partners um, that we work with currently, which is consists of Seacom Public Schools, Attleboro North, Attleboro Mansfield, and us. Um, and we're looking in areas of STEAM um, to really concentrate in for the pathway. That application process is probably going to be filed over the next, I'd say, 18 months to 24 months because it is a pretty spe this specific process that you have to um, utilize it. So. It's really trying to figure out what what are the needs of the area of Norton that would actually support the labor force, um, which right now I would say is a lot considering that everybody's having a hard time finding. The fourth, the third one is career technical education. Some of you would know that uh, in the traditional sense of uh, vocational technical education, we do have a southeastern. This is not about um, for the public to know. We currently have a chapter seventy four <clears throat> business technology marketing program already that we started to. Years ago, we enrolled about 66 to 66 kids um, last year in the program. They're taking courses that are aligned to career technical education. Um, what we're looking at next is public safety. Um, we're looking in the area of EMT and uh, criminal justice and all of that. That again, that's an application process with the state to become certified. Um, that one particular also probably needs the hiring of staff. So we really have to take a look. We're not looking to duplicate electrical and plumbing. We wouldn't have that type of space and materials, et cetera. But there are a number of, of new career tech ed programs that are very much workforce and or community college and or specific technical school or even four years. So again, each of these can go in so many different directions and actually could in, intertwine. The alternative education um, um, program model that's before you here, and again, I'd like to change this name to something more creative and doesn't have a stereotype with it, is to really take a look at our graduation requirements for students who are not in the traditional sense, uh, students that beyond having to take four years of English and having to take US history and having to take PE, which are all state requirements, what would those local um, requirements look like for a student? Um, so you're looking in those particular areas and, and all of these as well, but in that particular area, you're looking at cooperative education, working with students who are working, who um, want to work, who are in uh, specifically working at, as a, could be working as a laborer, for example, um, and learning a trade, but not necessarily in the traditional sense of a vocational program. And what does that look like? Or go to a student who can actually take courses here. So they want to go to college, but they want to take a um, CNA program. Could we put a CNA program and allow, as you guys all know, a couple of years ago, uh, we had a student who graduated with a CNA and is now at Boston College in the nursing program. I'm sure getting that background didn't hurt her in her process, although she was also a fantastic student. Um, so in this particular case, the reason why I don't like alternative education, because it, it labels some type of a student. This could yeah. be any student, you know, um, and, and, and um, that's important to me because, you know, when, once the kid gets labeled, um, this could also be motivational, depending on that background. So this is just the general report. You're going to start to see some more information at, at uh, school committee meetings about these. We, we do have some administrators that are working on some of this, and then we want to bring in some staff. And then we also need professional expertise in two of the three of these, or three of the four of these, we're going to need professional expertise. We have the edu edu uh, Education Alliance already working with us with the early college. The innovation pathways requires all that data and information that's from workforce. So that's going to require that we also have people in the industry be part of that. Career Tech Ed requires that you have um, a advisory board of people that are actually working in the field. Uh, that's part of the requirement. Um, so just to give you that general information. Can I ask a couple questions? Sure. Um, go back to the early college. Who covers the tuition? Not so necessarily that, how much, but who covers that? Right now, we're working on trying to create between all of the schools in UMass the best tuition for students. So um, typically, for example, a graduate course at, at a state college might cost $6,000, mm -hmm. and you're basically dividing it by all the bodies. However, we are also going after some federal funds okay. as a cohort. Um, that's one of the ideas, is that if, if it's just Norton High School going after it, 
it's going to be a problem. But if we have kids from different types of uh, communities and, and different backgrounds, that will only help in the application process. And then third parties is the other way um, as well. Um, federal stimulus money is something that all of the superintendents that are in this group have had some discussions about because it, it would be, it does fit the criteria. Um, but eventually, as you'll know, the money goes away. So you have to come up with, with a, a scenario that keeps some type of finances coming in, um, including partners. The innovation pathway one does potentially have some grant money that comes with it for startup costs. And then another question. So what's in it for UMass? Is is the expectation that they're going to capture some students for the UMass system? Sure. But there isn't a requirement. Right. So the expectation is that we have planning enrollment in every community that's not a city in Bristol County and, <clears throat> and around us right now. Um, and what's happening is they have currently in the UMass system seen declines in some of the UMass college, state colleges and um, as high as one third, 33% less students attending in one of the state colleges, uh, state universities in the North Shore. Um, UMass Dartmouth themselves are down 10%. Um, and all of the schools, one, one of the best success stories has been UMass Lowell. Uh, another success story has been UMass Boston. Uh, UMass Amherst is huge, as we all know. I'm not hearing statistics coming out of them that it's hurting, but the competition is becoming more significant. The other issue that is important is that we're starting to see more and more private schools no longer do a needs-based um, financial aid, but solely a merit-based. Merit um, if you remember three years ago, Holy Cross announced that you know, although they have a $100 million endowment, um, that over the next uh, 30 years, they would have zero. And so they moved to a merit-based uh, system and not a needs-based system. So. What this does is also make our kids more competitive, regardless if they're applying. So if they're applying to St. Anselm's, for example, or they're applying to to, um, to Stonehill, they might not get any per se credit, but they could make an argument for some type of credit, uh, depending on the major. But more importantly, um, working around the idea that they didn't take a AP test to, to show that they could do college work. They actually took a college class to show they could do college work. I think we all know that the UMass system, um, UMass Amherst, it costs kids from Massachusetts more money to go there than to go out of state. Right. So, um, well, look at the um, look at the UMaine, UMaine, right. the UMass price. I mean, pretty creative. Uh, right. Approach. So, it would be nice for our students to have a little bit of a buffer if they chose to go into the UMass system to have those courses accepted as part of their college credit to save them a semester or a full year or yeah and i think if you have declining in moment it's kind of like this choice decision do you, do you try to you know market yourself and and fill a seat uh, even though you're only getting three and a half years of tuition instead of four or, or do you just say no i'm not going to take four years of tuition right. karen i'll tell you i don't understand how the people in Massachusetts aren't up in arms about the, the cost of in-state tuition. It's insane. It, yeah. It's insane. It, yeah, it was cheaper for it is, it is insane to me. college yeah. age kids to leave the state. I didn't realize that again. So mm -hmm. you're basically paying for them through your taxes. And then when your kid gets in, and it's supposed to be, yeah. you know, right. they, they, they screw you over as well. So and it's mainly it's UMass. Yeah. Unconscionable, oh, quite just, honestly. Yeah. It's All a right. great opportunity for yeah. our students. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Um, no? Yeah, I just I just want to make one comment. I think that that's a great idea for the kids to be going to school with students of their own peer, their own peers, because some kids might be intimidated by it and they might not take the class because they're too intimidated. But knowing that their peers are going to be part of it, that makes a huge difference. And speaking from <clears throat> UMass Amherst, where both of my kids went, it was cheaper for them to go to Southern New Hampshire University, Franklin Pierce, or uh, the other one, just because of the money that they gave. UMass was the most expensive. One of the things that I learned about Kane State, I'm interesting that you just brought that up, I just recently learned that Kane State will take any student that's in a traditional career tech education program in Massachusetts. And if they're going to Kane State for four years to major in the major that they graduated from the book, they're giving them a full, a full semester. Credit. So they're only going there for three and a half years, or they decide to go for four years because they're going to piggyback on 
what usually happens, as you know, is they figure back on studying abroad or they end up with another minor or double major or go for another certificate. But it was interesting that the college, some colleges are being creative like that um, as part of their approach. And it might not hurt, um, Joe, I know that Wheaton is in the process of a major transition with sort of a president search, but um, it might not be bad to sort of start a conversation with them. Yeah, their new president comes on board, I believe, in January. The president has been named, and I, I plan to go weeks after that to introduce myself and, and see if we can have some further conversations. Okay. Great. Uh, we're going to move on to number eight. Vote to elect Kathleen Stern as school committee delegate at the Massachusetts Association of School Committees annual business meeting on November 6, 2021. Damon, tonight you are not voting on the resolution, but you do have them. Um, you'll vote it at your next meeting. But uh, Ms. Stern has been your delegate. Um, the delegate is that she attends at minimum the meeting on the 6th of November, where they vote on all the resolutions, and she represents your vote as that meeting unless you just give her the realm to vote the way that she wants. Kathleen, do you want to do that again? Um, I have to be honest. So right now, I guess nobody from our district is attending and right now it's only virtual. Um, so I'm on a wait list for an in-person. Um, if it does come through, um, you know, I, I would go in person, but Usually the delegate uh, meeting is either Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. For some reason this year, it's on a Saturday morning. So unless we, unless I wanted to make sure that you guys did get the resolutions, because unless you have strong feelings about one or another, um, I, I don't even know how they're going to do it virtually. Yeah, I don't, I don't love, I don't love number nine, mm -hmm. but outside of that, I really didn't have any issues with it. And, and nine, it's, it's, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. So, yeah. Well, here's my, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, so Kathleen, I, I, I'm also, as you typically know, I go down there, um, you know, do all this, the, we've actually presented at it and all of that, um, where the idea of attending one of those meeting, meetings virtually all day from workshop to workshop just as it enticed me, to be quite honest. I think my concern um, that maybe needs to be discussed at some point is the purposes of the resolution. They seem to be, to, to, to get a lot of things started, and then they seem to die. And so wouldn't it be better to take a resolution and vote it and bang on the door some elected officials and say, can you file this bill, please? Um, so I totally agree because we, we voted, I think it was two years ago, um, we voted an NCAS thing that I've never seen again. And we also voted on the MTELs that I've never seen again. So I, I don't know why we vote for something. Like you say, you vote for something, it passes or it doesn't pass. And then there's not, nothing ever done about it. It, it is frustrating. I, I think my response to that probably is, I think, I think there may be a vast overestimation of how much power we hold. Yeah, for sure. So, <laughs> for sure. I mean, that's just the, the reality of it. Yeah. what it is. So you could vote tonight to put Kathleen into that situation and then and then rescind the vote the, the, the week of and or you know before the next meeting. Or she may be able to attend that meeting. The issue is going to be that it's going to be a bit a little bit like this. If you're there, they're still allowing for people online. So then how are we gonna I, when voting on something that's resolution that's going to be part of a of a you know something that's shared with the governor and all of that, the legislature and all of that, I don't know how you're gonna do that. Maybe some, maybe they have a clicker thing that they're using or some type of. Or, or as we just discussed, it's not shared with the, the governor or the reps. So we're just voting on it. All right, we're spinning. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so how does that leave us? Kathleen, do you, are you okay with doing it again? If, if, yeah, I, yeah, I have no problem doing it. I just, um, it might come down to the point of if, if they have it, I will go. But if they don't have it, then. But like Dr. Bayetta says, um, we can rescind it, I guess. So yeah. that's good. Okay. All right. Let's let's do that then. Um, all right. I would entertain a motion to elect Kathleen Stern as our school committee delegate at the Massachusetts Association of School Committee annual business meetings on November 6, 2021. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, Kathleen Stern. Yes. 
Alan Gallagher? Yes. Shari Cohen? Yes. Dan Sheedy? Yes. Tanessa Foss? Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, that's going to bring us to other business. Uh, and Dan, I think I'm going to start with you because I know you have something. Yep. Um, we have a open invitation from the Norton Veterans Council uh, regarding the Veterans Day Parade in town. Uh, the parade will be held Thursday, November 11th, 2021. In the event of bad weather, ceremonies will be inside of the yell. Participants in the parade will include Boys and Girl Scouts of Norton. Um, parade will start at the yell school at 930 and step off at 10. So meeting at 930, all military personnel are welcome to march. Parade will go down uh, east on Main Street to the Veterans Stone Monument at the corner of Pine and Main for a brief ceremony. Upon completion, the procession will reform and proceed west from the town common. For continued Veterans Day ceremonies, this year's parade marshals are William McNeil and Linda Winship. Upon completion, all formation will return to the Yale for uh, refreshments in the cafeteria. Please RSVP by calling Gary Cameron, 508-265-0442. Anybody down there, No. No. Just one of the handouts that you have um, from Bicode's quality report. That's for your information and it is required by statute that I provide that to you. And you'll see that there's a employee of the texture, Dean Sullivan, now the executive director there. Uh, okay, uh, I have one thing, and it's kind of a follow on to something that's been going on for a while here. Um, after kind of discussing with, with members of the school committee individually and putting out some feelers to um, some other people. I think uh, with respect to the the policy issue that we have right now in front of the union, um, Joe, you and I have kind of discussed this slightly, I think. We need to start thinking about moving forward here. Um, so I think we, we're all in agreement that what we're going to look at is not this coming Monday, but the following Monday to start that up. It should give you enough time to get whatever information you need from parents as far as who's in or who's not in. Um, it's not to say that we're not going to continue the to engage with the MTA about this, we have to, um, and certainly again, it's, it's, it's their right and, and they should, uh, but at some point we need to start moving forward here on this, so. Okay, we'll do. Okay, uh, does anybody have any objections to that? Just, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody does, but. So October 25th? October 25th is the date that I know, yeah. So not this Monday, but the following Monday. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. Town meetings that evening at seven. Okay. That doesn't. That's a different. Subject. No, I just. I was wondering why I had the date in my head for some reason. Okay. Um, no other business prior to here. I don't. Have I just have a quick question. I'm wondering if it's possible. I know there was some talk about um, people wondering and a lot of speculation about what the numbers are at the high school as far as getting to that eighty percent number. Is that something that we can publicly share? Sure. With people, is that yeah. something you want to talk about? I don't know if we have numbers for high school and middle school, just so people middle, know where we're at. Middle school is a working project because, as you know, we have an entire grade that that's, that's a bubble. Um, in terms of um, the high school, we just reached seventy percent. Um, that's all in um, seventy point eight percent, I think it was. Um, I'll get. I should get a new number Monday or Tuesday. I did get a request today um, from. Uh, a third party about um, doing another clinic just for the high school. And as you know, the boosters are also up for potentially staff. Um, but people can also just use CVS or Walgreens yeah. right now. So um, Hopkinton has just received permission for the 80% rule um, at their high school. I know that um, Ashland. Well, that's they're approved. They're approved. We will now have to go back to the school committee. Right. To have the school committee change the policy to say that for this school, it's right, it's 80 percent will have been met, and they must be leaning that way if they're if they're seeking the approval. They must be leaning that way. I believe so. Yeah, it sounded like from the article that the, the members came in before they could get everything together for their meeting, so they pushed the vote out. Sure, but yeah, that they, requires Desi. Approval to yeah, De Desi is requiring us to, to basically file a, a, a statement saying that I hereby. Certified. certified that so on and so forth we did have numbers so to sherry's question we had about 34 students at the high school that are not part of the state registry system so that may mean that that just 
that the information hasn't gone through yet. It could be that um, they went to their doctor's office and it hasn't gone through it or some other way. Um, so those families are being reached out and being asked if they would like to share one way or the other. And then if they do, they it's a yes, it gets added to the to the pile. So the likelihood of us getting to 80 percent, um, I will tell you that the commissioner's call for the public as well. The commissioner's call this week was the Hopkinton situation being a success. There are a number of high schools on the 495 belt that are there. Um, in talking to a local superintendent, the state numbers show that they are as a community, but their actual numbers aren't there yet. So, and remember, when you show look at the community number, um, what you're seeing is all students in that bracket. So they may not attend Norton Public School. So they may not attend Norton High. They may be at Phoenix. They may be at Southeastern. They may be at the Aggie. They may be at Severian. But they're still in the 16 to 19 bracket or the right. And so in that bracket may include people who are not students as well. Correct. Yeah. Right. So the 19 year olds that are already, right. you know, that are that are not part of our enrollment per se. Right. And then um, some of the questions that have come in um, is like school systems that are six to twelve, like a middle high school. They've asked, well, do you count that as six to eight and then nine to twelve, or do you do it just six to twelve? And they actually could go six to twelve, and then the question becomes the, the secondary question becomes, well, if they're not vaccinated at all, potentially. Are they part of the 80 percent? So this, the state's working out those situations. And as far as staff, they've been asked. We've had staff, ask staff, staff um, were asked at the high school through the nurse's office. We are utilizing the nurse's office for, for the major reason that they are significantly confidential yep. medical personnel. Um, and then I get the, the data and I've, I've asked for that from all of our schools in terms of the staffing. And that staff would include anybody that's in the building at any point. So if you come in and sub once a week, you're part of that. You're part of that collection of data. Okay. I just think it's important to share that information because there's a lot of, a lot of stories going around. So yeah, it's always the, nice the, to get the, the biggest the the biggest success so far. Without you know, getting into a huge debate, the biggest su success so far has been test and state for us. It is it is vocal numbers that are. That are able to just go to the nurse in the morning, 15 minutes back to class they go. Um, and, and that's where we identified someone that tested positive. And right. Well, the, the testing positive is through the contact tracing protocols. And then the only negative that we're seeing is in this building in particular, the middle school, more and more students coming to school, not COVID sick, but sick. Mm -hmm. And then us trying to figure out what the sickness is. And as you know, there's a lot of crossover between the flu and the bug, or I myself um, am vaccinated, but I had a, a test done the other day because I was stuffy. I had no cough. I had no fever. It was allergies for me. It was gone three days later, but because I visit classrooms, because I am in the buildings, I just did what I thought for me was the best medical decision. There was another question, but I can't remember. Okay. I feel like we're going to have time for that question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, if nobody has any other business uh, to bring for us, I'm going to open it up to public comment. I'm assuming that everybody who's come to our meeting, because we never ever get people at these meetings, uh, I'm assuming everybody wants to speak. So, um, open comment session. What we're going to do is we're going to limit it to three minutes for a speaker, if you can. Um, try and stay on topic. Uh, and we'll. Give it a run through. There was yeah. before. I just remembered my question, if you don't mind, for a second. Do, so, do we have any clarification on kids who are vaccinated? Um, because in reading the the, uh, the print of the test and stay, kids who are vaccinated cannot participate in test and stay. They have no quarantine restrictions. That's right. So even so far, that's the regulation. Right. So even though kids, even though people who are vaccinated can be carriers and can still get COVID. There's no test and stay for them. There's no, if they're close contact, go continue on. That's correct. Right. Okay. Bear with us one second. I think that's just test and tap. Yeah. Is anybody coming up to speak? Okay. Please want to speak on the side of the. Can we move over yeah, 
And when you come up, you can just state your name for the as well. How are we all doing? Uh, Nick Schleicher, 40 North Worcester Street, Norton Mass. Um, glad to hear that we're at least starting to move forward. Um, but I got a little thing here just because I didn't know where we were at. I'm going to just read it because it's easier for me to collect my thoughts when it's on the paper. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman Savas, you told me, Mr. Schleicher, hold our feet to the fire. Well, I'm the type of person who will, and now I am. Uh, I've asked for instance virtually, and I keep getting sent in different directions. So now everyone is together. Hopefully, we can actually get some concrete answers. I want to take this time to explain. <clears throat> I want to take this time and explain the frustration over the past five weeks or so in this district. Here's a timeline of my experience over the past five weeks. Nine eight North School Committee holds an open forum for all taxpayers and parents to express concerns with DESI mandates of masking students in public schools. September 9th, School Committee votes unanimously in favor of making masks optional at the Little Lances program as they are a part of the DESI and state mandate. 915, JCS Assistant Principal Mrs. Baker is instructed by Dr. Bayetta to send out a survey to Little Lances parents asking their opinions on the mask wearing procedures. September 24th, the, the survey results are sent to the Little Lances community in which 52% of parents voted for no mask or optional mask, 48% for mandated mask, 76% said they would not leave the program regardless of this decision, 21% were still undecided at that time, and 3% they would, said they would pull their child if they didn't get their way. On uh, 9-25, I believe, sorry, uh, 14 days after the policy was voted on unanimously by all of you, the update uh, the town citizens received at the last school committee meeting were very vague and something along the lines of we're in negotiation with the Norton Teachers Association. September 24th, 15 days after the policy change, I emailed five school committee members asking for clarification on what exactly was going on with the situation and what was the holdup. I got a response from no one. Wednesday, September 29th, 20 days after the policy was voted on and five days after my original email, I followed up with a second email asking for a response. Finally, Mrs. Cohen responded to me telling me that Dr. Bader would uh, be able to answer specific questions uh, around the negotiations. I forwarded the original email to Dr. Baeda as instructed. Dr. Baeda said he was not on the original email and thinks it should be kept with the school committee. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Baeda did comment that if he said Chairperson Savas thinks it is appropriate, Dr. Bader will respond. So, uh, Thursday, September 30th, Chairperson Savas uh, responds approving Dr. Baeta to answer my questions. Dr. Baeta sends an email later that morning responding to my questions. And here we are five weeks later. No public communication of the Little Lances community, no updates, no transparency whatsoever from the school committee. We get absolutely nothing unless we have to reach out. And even that communication is very limited. We are just left to sit, wait, and become increasing, increasingly frustrated with the process. And it has me questioning what exactly is the point of the Norm School Committee. My hope here is that the school committee would have pushed us further already, that you were being pre proactive with your information rather than reactive. Why are we sitting back for five weeks and not asking updates from Dr. Bayetta and communicating those updates to the Little Lance's parents? Your job is to be the liaison from the taxpayers and parents of this, uh, of this town to our schools. You're supposed to be our advocates. You're an extension of us. I assume the reason you got involved in schools and on the school committee is to enhance that relationship. This is why you've been elected to the position you hold. It's not Dr. Baeta's job to respond to me and waste time in his day uh, responding to emails that our elected leaders on the school committee should be able to handle. He does not need to answer to me. I'm not his boss. And quite frankly, I'm just probably a pain to him at this point. I imagine he cringes when he sees an email from me. I certainly appreciate the responses from him, but why is he dealing with this mess? The words of we are parents too. We want the best for our children. We want to communicate with parents. We stress transparency. We want Norton's Norton school parents to be involved in our schools. We want our schools to fit within the Norton community. Those words I've heard over and over throughout the years with this group. You appear, uh, you appear to take actions on those words. You voted for a change in policy. You seem to be around the right path. And then the execution of the policy came. And that has made me think where your true intentions lie. I cannot fathom how you can sit back as a committee and not demand answers and accountability of an educational policy you changed because clearly the uh, committee felt strong enough about it. It appears you have also been informed, uh, as, ha as have I, Dr. Bahader informed that the policy requires impact bargaining with the Norton Teachers Association because this directly affects some of the members' working conditions. Has the school committee asked why? Has there any been, has there been any conversations with Dr. Bayetta, with legal counsel, 
with the NTA asking what exactly needs to be an impact, impact bargained. I don't know all the collective bargaining policies and procedures. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I do. However, I did my research. I prepared myself for this meeting as much as I possibly could. I found chapter 150E on masslegislative.gov, which includes language about labor relations and public employees. And I also found the 11th edition of a guide to Massachusetts public employee collective bargaining law. I've read both documents pretty thoroughly over the last two weeks. Okay. I, want, I want to ask the committee, was yeah, that? You're, you're, you're running over your, actually a couple minutes over your time. Oh, if someone else wants to yield time, time. I'll wait my time to two. Okay, anybody else? Okay, good, thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, I want to ask the committee and superintendent, what exactly is changing in the teacher's working conditions from September 8th to September 9th? They are still in the classroom. They are still teachers of the Little Lances program. They're still going to be required to wear a mask as teachers. They have all the proper PPE, cleaning supplies, air purifiers, updated HVAC systems, windows open to provide fresh, fresh air, test and stay protocols in place, and have had ample opportunity to protect themselves with the vaccine. The common sense here is simple. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing is changing in their working conditions. And there's no difference from a teacher in Little Lancers to a teacher in first grade at the JCS. The only thing that is changing is students' learning conditions. And finally, after 19 months, I think we can all agree they were finally about to change for the better. Uh, we, know, we know those times are from pre-March 2020. To me, this is not a working condition issue. This has been mislabeled by the NTA union representatives, and it appears no one has been able to push this matter correctly. This is a matter of educational policy because it directly affects the students, not the teachers. The school committee voted on an educational policy on 9-9, and by given definition on page 156 and 157 of the document, permissive subjects of bargaining involve core governmental decisions. Either the employee or the union may re refuse to negotiate over a permissive subject. And right there, among other things, is a list of examples of permissive subjects. It reads educational policy. I'm putting myself in your shoes. I understand you lose a teacher's union respect, your job becomes much more challenging and quite frankly impossible. With the amount of power the unions have on our districts and on our school committees. We have seen this across the country for the past few weeks. However, my suggestion is we implement the educational policy change that you all made. And if Dr. Bayetto or the school committee feels it's worth neg negotiating with the NTA, you can continue negotiations and keep the union admin relationship strong. However, the policy of recommending and not requiring masks and little lances is carried out immediately. The teachers work through the negotiations and the educational policy change when both sides reach an agreement and where everybody wins. This is nothing new to CBAs. The Norton Police and the Norton Fire have worked in this town without contracts and without CBAs and have still provided outstanding services as their unions were negotiating with town officials. It's our public safety departments. If our public safety departments can provide life-saving emergency response, responses, I believe our teachers can handle a small educational policy change. Let's as a community push this finally across the finish line. This matter does not need to be collectively bargained. The NTA leadership needs to simply drop the grievance, accept the school committee's decision, um, decision on op 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 sorry, accept the school committee's decision on optical, optimal masking, optional masking, and the Little Lances program, and look out for the best interests of our children. The parents have spoken, the survey has spoken, your school committee has spoken. Stop hiding behind the union language, stop using our children as pawns. Stop holding our children hostage because your agenda has been interrupted and start giving our children a chance to thrive in the normal public school system. Thank you. Okay. I've been advised during these sessions not to respond. And so, of course, I'm going to completely ignore that and respond anyways. Um, so, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, on communication, um, the the lack of communication wasn't for lack of desire to communicate, more so it was there was not much to say, quite frankly. Um, I appreciate you holding our feet to the fire. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember the, the different questions you asked. Um, you know, we, we were moving forward. Uh, you heard earlier, okay, starting not this coming Monday, but following Monday, we're going to move forward with the policy. I understand the frustration that this thing moves slowly. Um, I, I don't know that I agree with with you that the teachers association is using every response. Um, they have the right to do this. You know, uh, I, I get that you think that we can go around that somehow. Um, I appreciate that you realize that that puts us in a, in a weird tenuous position. Kevin, you don't need to, it's, I, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to yeah. back and forth, sorry. Yeah, I don't want to back and forth with you, but, um, you know, it's, it, it, I get it, I do. 
and we're moving it forward. And most of the stuff you actually all probably all the factual stuff you said, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, you know, we, we can only do so much. I think we all are a little bit frustrated with the pace of it. Um, maybe not as much as you guys, but you know, we're frustrated with it as well. We don't like to do things up here and say, Hey, we want, we want to do this. This is the direction we want to move in and then not get there. So we are trying to get there. Trust me. I, I, I get it. I get the frustration. I, it's, we're not trying to stonewall it. I, I think I can speak for myself and others will speak for themselves here. You know, we didn't vote put that through because we didn't want it. That's how we feel. So, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you on that. You know, it's some of the stuff you said was, you know, was, it was pretty harsh, quite honestly. Like, I don't, I don't think we're, we're not trying to serve you guys. I think we are. And yeah, I mean, hundred percent, we, you know, we ran for this to, to make the educational system better. This isn't something we signed on for, but you know, to quote Belichick, it is what it is, right? You get you get the cards you're dealt, and you you play that hand. So we're playing it as best we can right now. We're trying to get this thing through. Um, you know, we're looking at our numbers and hoping we get to eighty percent. Maybe we can pull Hopkinton and, and you know, do what they do. I don't know. We're going to get there, but you know, I don't I don't think we're in disagreement. And and I get the idea that you guys want this done very quickly. Believe it or not, this is as quickly as we can move it forward. Right. And it's it's where we're at. So, so come October twenty fifth, is Little Lance's unmasked? Little, well, not unmasked. It is unmasked. Masked optional. It's optional. So why can we put it through October twenty fifth, but we can't put it through now? Well, I want to give Dr. Bad some time to. We took five weeks to us. <laughs> but, oh, I, I remember the one one thing I wanted to, I wanted to mention. Um, the, the survey. You understand that the purpose of the survey. I, I think there might be some misunderstanding about the survey. The survey was not to find out, hey, what does everybody want to do? And, and because we we want to change our policy based on what you want. The survey was, and, and Dr. Biden and I talked about this before it went out, and, and I was instrumental in having that go out. It was to find out where we were going to stand, because that can matter, right? If if we send it out and only three people come back and say, yeah, we don't want masks, that's a whole different situation than half the people not wanting masks. So we just needed to know where we stood. I, I think there might have been some misunderstanding about what the purpose well, well, was. I think ultimately the survey doing it after you made a policy was probably a bad move. That probably should have been done before a policy was made because sending it out after the fact isn't going to help us because we just voted on a policy and then all those numbers come back and say, hey, yeah. we're going to yank our kids. It would have been a very easy decision for to say, hey, we're, we're going to go back on a policy. We're right. Gonna... The only thing is, is I, I, and this is my own personal preference, I hate to see us in a situation where Every time we decide something, we're sending out a poll. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to do that. Like, I completely agree. I'm going to vote my mind and my heart, up. <laughs> and I want to be I'm be comfortable with, with the vote as my own vote and say, you know, this is this is how I feel about this. Yeah. So, you know, I get what you're saying. Could we could we have polled people beforehand? Yeah, we could have, but I, I'm not sure how much we're going to get out of that too. Like, right. you know, it's it's unless you get every single person responding, you can almost kind of say, all right, we got to throw the data away because in any type of those polls, right? Any any time somebody whatever. The people that respond are the people who feel most vehemently about it one way or the other. And so that's not necessarily, you kind of get the tips and the tails on the argument. So I get what you're saying, you know, uh, with respect to the, the, the last question before we kind of got sidetracked. Yeah, we, it's it's been five weeks. I, I understand. And we're moving forward now. And, you know, Dr. Bayer has not heard a lot about this. You know, we, we want this done. It's, I'm sure, surprising him slightly as well. So I want to give him a little time. I think a week is fair. To let, let him get the data back from parents and say, yep, my kid has to be masked. My kid could be mask optional, whatever. I think it's a fair amount of time. If you don't, I, I get it. I get why you're frustrated, but it's it's a reasonable amount of time for him. Can I ask a short question? Why wasn't this done over the last five weeks? Why are we just starting this now? I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. I have an answer. I'll give you the answer for it. Um, the school committee made a decision to go with an early childhood vote versus a K-12 to vote. Um, they are one of the only school committees in the state that's done that. Most of the other school districts that have that have a preschool that is actually not physically in the same building with the rest of, in our case, a K-3. That's what complicates matters in terms of working conditions, is that you have to work through those students that are not just in the preschool. They are in parts of the, other parts of the building where K-2, K-plus grades are required to wear a mask. So that's part of the process of getting to a resolution. And if you remember, the biggest complaint that I had on behalf of the committee and myself to you folks was, we literally found out 
right at the beginning of school on what the regulation was going to be. They were left originally, if you remember, to the school committee, and they were taken from the school committee on the 24th or 25th of August. I don't quote me on the day, but it's around that. And then we were starting school, I think, with the teachers that Tuesday or Wednesday, and we didn't have a full school committee meeting scheduled until the 8th as part of that process. Okay, we're going to move on here. Bye. As you, you guys are having that conversation, I was having this against my mask. It did not move at all. I'm going to put it in real quick. And I got a couple questions. Is there um, an industrial hygienist that's actually stated that these kids have to wear masks inside schools? And if so, there should be one for each single building individually, and the parents have the right to see the documentation of the industrial hygienist that says to put the mask on the school. Because otherwise, that's against the law. I said, you can't just say you need to put a mask on. That's that's why they they put in stores masks are optional. My only response to that would be that I'm in. One very clear particular case, I'm following a K to 12 state mandate back to the district. I don't have an option on if they're wearing masks or not to do that. Yeah, but without an industrial hygienist saying that each building is cleared to do so, you're not supposed to. Well, my that sounds like a great question for the commission then. That's that's yeah. that's, I, I don't that's know a what serious I don't question. Know what, right. you're, that, you're then, Techni right. Technically, like this shouldn't there should not be no sort of mandate at all. But you're coming at us when right. we're, we're we're doing what we're being told to do. Uh, I mean, I think you know by our vote of five zero where we kind of all feel about this. Yeah, I'm not even gonna do this because I already did it last time and I, I actually didn't even start yeah. it. That's a valid question. <laughs> I already did yeah. it in front of you guys. I mean, I would go to the commissioner seen. with that. Here's the thing: last year we had a we had a state of emergency, right? We had a statewide mask mandate. We did what we were told, right? Now. We don't have either of those things, but we have a commissioner telling us what needs to happen in the schools. Right? Well, I, there's... I, I, got, I got, can us as parents ask if you guys can request the industrial hygienist that says that these kids have to wear the masks in schools? You, the, you... the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education worked with the Department of Public Health. I don't know if they have a hygienist. I know there's a lot of titles on. On, on the memo system that I get from them. There's only 15 and in Massachusetts. And, and they, they're the ones who made the decision on public schools. They came from DESE in conjunction with the Department of Public Health. That's how the decision was made. I, I don't know what specialist they used or didn't use. I don't have any of that. I can tell you that we spent time and money looking at our air exchanges in our buildings and our air quality. We paid for tests. At the, uh, at the beginning of COVID way back, and we did it again at the start of this school year because in, in March it's when we moved there, all the kids came back with masks, not the hyper -pump. So we did that at our own and shared that as part of our showing that our building's air quality is safe and that the air exchanges are taking place according to the recommended uh, minimum requirements. Didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. I no, that's okay. I, 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 just, just, I think that you feel as though we have more power than we do. We we really don't. No, not in this case. We really. really don't. And it is beyond frustrating. I, I feel your frustration because I'm there personally. I'm I, done with this. I mean, I, I, I followed the rules last year. Now you've got clubs in Boston with people are side by side drinking, oh, okay. singing with no masks on, and that's Chanted okay. Brandon. Yet our children are sitting at desks with masks on. I understand your frustration. I am right there with you. Unfortunately, the commissioner, that we don't matter. It doesn't matter. We send a letter off saying give it back to the local level. Nothing, nothing. So maybe if parents like yourself start to form and you guys go storm the state house, they then maybe they'll start to, to listen. Already been at the state house. We, he won't speak to us either. Yeah, he won't speak to us. I called out Baker to, to have a one-on-one -on -one debate on Fox 25 News, and he would not respond. I called out Desi. I, I contacted them. I reached out. I, I've done everything. I hear you. I, and they, they're not responding. And it's not right, because right, everybody here is being abused. You guys are all being abused at being forced to wear a mask. That's not right at children. And I was under the impression that the school could not give my child a mask. Is that correct, or is that? 
Am I wrong about that? We've been providing masks since day one. Even if they have a mask? Yeah, we, we our policy states that it has to be uh, a mask and not a gator um, originally because we had to, instead of a face mask, instead of a face covering, we had a actual mask policy that was. Yeah, because the shields don't make no sense. Like, we do have virus to, can't go wait, under and around. Well, we do have students and staff medically that do wear the shields. That has happened in that. That, that doesn't make sense. But my daughter was at recess and she goes to school with two masks a day and she's changed, she's supposed to change her mask in the middle of the, the day, at least after lunch. And instead of her getting, I don't know exactly what happened. She is only six years old. Um, I guess at recess, she lost the mask or whatever, but she was given this mask right here instead of the mask that she has. And I personally send her in a, in her with a mask that has one thin layer because I do not want no triple coated double thing trapping even more in. Because as everybody knows, I already proved the CO2. I, Feel like an idiot though. I didn't. I didn't hit the stop button. <laughs> right, so I gotta. I gotta cut you off because you actually three minutes over unless somebody wants to yield to him. That's this all right. Good. No. Okay. And I'm gonna. Right, before you talk, about, yeah. we'll hold answers to anything till the end, just because it's hard for me to to keep track of the time. I have to like, if we're answering in the middle, I have to stop this time and start it. We start it. So. Um, Does there have to be a time limit? There's so few people here. Yeah. Now, yeah, we we we've got to keep it to to the three minutes. I mean, it's it's. it's last, our, last time we did, we have like two yeah, hours. Yeah, it's. I, I'm on the other time. I understand. Right. Sure. Okay. Uh, and I mean, we're, we're, just a couple. Listen, of I'm, I'm I'm not saying I don't want anybody to speak right. I'm just saying, it's just not know. a lot. Okay. Um. Well, I have a lot of questions, so. Hopefully you can write quickly then. Um, so my first question is, what's the update on the letter, Denez, that you had handed out at the last school committee? Signed or? today. Okay. Oh, can we get a copy of that? Uh, sure. You, I'm sure I have my email. <laughs> yeah. Just send that to me. Thank you. Um, also, are you aware of the proposal that was submitted by um, a few superintendents out of the old colony round table to Desi? Is anybody familiar with this? So this is something I'm asking if you guys would be interested in doing as well to help do something for us. Um, they submitted a proposal to the commissioner, which was that if a school cannot demonstrate the 80% vaccination rate, then each community could use their own town or county data to determine a mask requirement. Each school district may also overrule the metric listed below if the percent positivity in an individual building meets these criteria. This would be the case for Berkeley, this is their proposal. Um, we've been below 1% since school opened. All quarantine and testing protocols through DESE would still be applied and followed. And so their proposal was, if you are at 1% or below positivity rate, no masks would be required for students or staff. If you're between 1.1% and 2.9%, masks would be recommended for all unvaccinated students and staff. If you're between excuse me, between 3.0 and 4.9%, masks strongly recommended for all students and staff. And if you're at 5.0 or higher, masks required for all students and staff. Um, so this is something I thought was a very creative proposal. I was wondering if you guys might be interested in doing something similar to that. I know you're in a different round table, superintendents are, maybe I have plenty of contacts. I would love to work with you guys to get you connected with other school committee members who also wanna do something like this. Um, and then my other question regarding this subject is, does the district receive any money for hosting an injection clinic? Just curious on that. It does not. Thank you. Um, and then something completely different is regarding the letter that was um, basically publicized by the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland regard to the FBI and DOJ regarding parents and school boards. Are you all familiar with this letter? Yes. No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to know, are you aware that Merrick Garland's son-in-law is the co-founder of a company that supports and pushes critical race theory material? Are you aware of the name of this company? It's Panorama Education. Panorama is the service that's being used for the survey of our, of our students. Um, I'm curious, what research have you done on this group? Who is responsible for that research? I thought I heard Dr. Betty mention that it was a state requirement earlier. Is that true? No, those are two different surveys I was mentioning. One okay. is a health survey. It's not a 
a requirement when it comes to the state. Okay, so who's responsible for signing a contract with this company? How long is that contract for? Can we get a copy of that? If you go to Panorama's website, they make it very clear in their FAQs that they are not associated with CRT at all. However, I'd like to read a few quotes from Panorama's co-founder in which he published in his company blog. This must change. As millions of people across the country stand up to protest this system of racism and oppression, we stand with them. We commit to dismantling systemic racism. We commit to embodying and spreading anti-racist practices. Education represents one of the most important levers for change in America. At worst, our education system can perpetuate oppression and injustice, withholding opportunity from children of marginalized communities and allowing racism to continue unchecked. We now serve 10 million students in 1,500 school districts. This puts us in a unique position to make change to our institutions through our partnership with school districts. A reimagined education system is our anti-racist protest. Um, and then here are a few questions that were part of a panorama education survey on part um, that were part of a social emotional learning survey by panorama that was sent to Rhode Island students. At your school, how often are you encouraged to think more deeply about race related topics when there are major news events related to race? How often do adults at your school talk about them with students? Do you know that Rhode Island state law allows Rhode Island residents who are US citizens to pre register to vote at age 16? Why are these questions relevant? What is the end goal? How do these questions improve the education of our children? One Panorama's workshop is titled SEL as Social Justice, Dismantling White Supremacy Within Systems in Self, and is designed to explore actionable strategies for using social and emotional learning as a vehicle for social justice and advocacy in your community. Panorama defines systemic racism as a sy systematic distribution of resources, power, an opportunity in our society to the benefit of people who are white. I'd like to know the school committee members' thoughts on this. Do you believe schools should be teaching things other than academics? Do you believe the school's place to push an ideology on the children? What would you like to do about this, if anything? I'd like to get a copy of the survey that's being sent out to grade three through 12. And Dr. Bayetta, you mentioned homeschooling numbers doubling from last year. And um, you know maybe this is part of the reason why. Dr. Sutton, one second. Anybody want to yield? You have two yielders left. I'm you, good. You've already yielded. You can't yield twice. I'm done. You're done? <laughs> I'm okay. done. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying the the initial um, the initial comment about the the proposal to um, to allow towns to have their own metrics, etc. I, I would I would look at it. I don't know much about it, and obviously it was a little bit hard to follow um, what everything was as you were going on. I will tell you positivity rate. And I know it's what they use. I think positivity rate is, is a little bit of a sketchy metric, quite frankly. Um, telling me how many people were positive and tested doesn't necessarily mean anything. Right. If one guy goes in and tests positive, it's not 100%. I mean, it's, you know, um, but, I, but I would look at it, certainly. I mean, if it's something that makes sense, yeah, because it doesn't sound like we're going to get to the 80. So I'm, I'm not against that, quite frankly. Um, with respect to, like, you know, can we see this, that, et cetera? Everything we do is public record. Every single thing by law is public record. So you can see whatever you want to see. Quite frankly, um, uh, and then with with respect to the whole CRT thing, I mean, listen, I'm I'm the wrong guy to be talking to about that. You know, I I judge people on the merits, and that's that. I mean, I I don't follow this whole thing. I don't really understand it. Quite frankly, as far as I know, we don't teach it, and I, I get that it's kind of the the movement du jour. Uh, I don't, I don't really have a ton of comments I on that. I respectfully state that if you're the chair of the school committee, you probably should read up on it. And CRT is now being relabeled well, as social I, emotional learning. I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in it. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the way we should approach things. You know, everybody's different. That's it. End of story. Every single person's different. Every single thing that you do and decide in your life and, and every interaction you have with somebody that changes who you are slightly, right? So tonight, you and I are talking right now, things about you and things about me are, are going to slightly change. We, we base our lives, we base our, how we perceive things on our lives, on our lives past. That's it. I don't need to sit here and say, oh, it's because I'm this or that, or I'm tall or short, or, you know, I, whatever. I, I, I don't, I don't prescribe to that, quite frankly. So I, I get what you're saying, but I should I should read up on it, but 
I, I I think I know where I stand on it without reading up. I, I read I read enough to know where I stand on it, quite frankly. Are you comfortable with that being a part of the Norton School District? It is not part of the Norton School District. <laughs> the social emotional learning that's being signed up to the well, I don't I don't think it's the same thing. thing. It's it's there's, part of there's no correlation. Yeah, they're not the same thing. Like, you know, are you are you okay in school? Are you, do you feel bullied? Is very different than CRT. They're very, very different things. But so, that's why I like a, a copy of that specific survey being sent out because I would like to see the you, questions that are being again public asked. record. You give you whatever you want. And yeah. and if it's something you see, you say, hey, you know, I don't like this. And and I look and say, Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I, I agree with you. Yeah, we'll we'll discuss that, you know. But to my knowledge, and and I feel like I have decent knowledge of it. There's nothing like that being taught in our schools. I, I know that it's again, it's the the thing to sure now for for people on, on on either side of the you know the aisle, if you will. We're just trying to teach our kids. We're trying to make our kids ready to to go out to the world and, and get a career and, and be good citizens. And I don't mean that to say like you have to do this to be good or that to be good. Just to make make smart decisions. You know, make them make them thinkers. I guess that's to me that's what education is about. That's that's it. It's make them make them able to think on their feet. Make them able to look through a problem and say, okay, what are the logical solutions to this problem? That's that's all we're trying to do here. We're just trying to get better kids. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'm still trying to figure out how we went from talking about masks to CRT. I, I don't even I, I don't even know how we even just got here. Open forum. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Hi. Uh, hey, General Neal, um, I have a couple of questions that are coming in from our guests at home. If you wouldn't mind um, me sharing those as well, since we're um, sure. having this open forum component. Um, the first one is from a gentleman named David. Does the school committee see the extremely high COVID cases since the start of school, especially the JCS school where the Little Answers program is housed? Do they still feel masks shouldn't be required? What are you going to do to keep our children safe when unmasked kids are in the same room? Can you just say that last part again? I couldn't hear you. What are we going to do to keep this? Absolutely. Um, do they still feel masks shouldn't be required? What are you going to keep do to keep our kids safe when unmasked kids are in the same room? I, I think, I mean, when, with the policy that we voted on, we're not, we're not telling people to walk through the door and take your mask off. If you feel more comfortable with a mask on, wear your mask. We're just saying that if you, if, if parents choose not to, then then don't. Well, I think it comes down to what the state gives us as guidance. Right. I mean, we're talking again. We're sitting here talking K to twelve and little answers. I mean, you know, little answers policy is what it is, but K to twelve is governed by what the state tells us. I mean, if they say this is what you have to do, then this is what we have to do. That's just how it works. So, I mean, I think, you know, this, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a real answer, but you know, we're talking about two different scenarios. But, I mean, we have had cases in all schools. It's just, that's how it's been. I mean, the numbers are published weekly on Fridays, I believe. So, it's the data is there, but what's, what's it all showing? Um, there's another question here. Um, if we get close to 80% as school, how can we ensure that those students who have chosen not to get vaccinated will not be bullied because they are ruining it for others? So my, my quick answer would be if we get close to 80%, but not over 80%, yes. in theory, DESE would still have everybody masked. So there really wouldn't be any way to know who did and did not get vaccinated. So... I, I don't. I don't see it as a as a valid question. That's all we have from Adam. Well, I think also we already have bullying um, protocols in place. They would they would be the things that we would go to. Yeah, and just for the record, uh, the anti-bullying law is very very clear. It is the only disciplinary issue that stays with the student during their entire time pre K to twelve. The student moves from eighth grade to ninth grade. Discipline starts anew. The bullying report stays with the student. So right. we would carry out under state statute, same protocols, 
um, if a student and was those are built upon, right? Those, those are built upon, including uh, potential uh, being a police matter. Also, one of the only ones besides drugs and alcohol and guns and, and uh, assault. And okay. For clarification, can I just ask? Um, I don't think anybody would really know who's vaccinated and who isn't. That's, that's not that's public. What I, that's what I was saying. Uh, no so I would assume that it's all confidential, correct? And that um, it's not like unless a person is sharing that information themselves, nobody else would really know the status, whether they were or were not vaccinated. So, Unless if you got over 80%, then you would, because yeah. someone would have to wear a mask per state guidelines right now. Right. So hopped in right now, those 50% of those kids or are vaccinated. It's or they could be choosing to wear one. You never know. It could be true. Then. But never let's face the facts here. Probably not gonna happen. Same. I, no, I can tell you, I can tell you as a former high school principal, it's a nightmare. Anything, anything you, you're gonna say 60%, 80%, 90%. I'm not I'm not agreeing with it. Just I'm just saying any type of a thing that isn't either you can or you can't. Is, 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 it, it's a cycle, it's a segregation, it's a cycle. And I've said this. Regardless of what you think of my certain my, my views on masking, the fact of the matter is, as a former high school principal, I can tell you it's a nightmare to say that 60, 80 percent of kids, you can do this, but the other 20, we're going to say, and then how you police it. It's, well, it's a nightmare to police, a nightmare. Anybody else, Jen? No, that was it. No, that was it. Okay. If, uh, if there's... No, there's one more. Oh, Jim, there's two, more. Two, more. two more, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Janagra. I'm a grandmother of a kindergartner. Um, well, it's basically, we've talked about masks and stuff and everything, but I have um, a high, uh, industrial hygienist, Steve Putty. He's one of the top of the country, and he's uh, he's done over 400 law cases and everything. And he, and I have a chart here. That, this is the diameter of a magnified hair, and this little dot is of one micron. The small little red dot, and the coronavirus is forty, is a tenth of a micron. So it's forty thousand times smaller than this area, and a thousand times smaller in diameter. So it goes through any mask you're wearing. The mat is like a mosquito going through a fence. That's the facts. But I mean, I just think that we should deal with facts. If we're going to deal with science and facts, we should deal with science and facts. And uh, like the sunlight dust that you see going. It's 500 times larger than Corona, COVID-19. So masks really don't protect you. There's a small aerosol that come through. And I, I think, uh, I think I, I sent you that. I think I sent it to Steve Putty. Yeah, I actually read it. You did? I did. Okay. <laughs> I promise you, I, did. I am reading the stuff I get. Okay. And also, so he was saying the best thing was for air, ventilation, air, opening up windows, getting air systems, that, that's way better because masks really don't um, do anything for getting rid of that. And then also scientific studies have shown that it lowers the oxygen levels in the blood while rising carbon dioxide levels, affects respiratory function, actually straps, exhales, viral pathogens, which increases the severity of viral overload by and neglect and colonize viruses and bacteria, and they're dangerous for those with asthma and respiratory issues. A major threat to a child's development due to anxiety, sleep disorders, and create fear of germs. And then he had a whole list of things that Dr. Petty also had a whole list of things. So then we go to testing. So testing has problems because of false positives. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the guy Carrie Mullis that invented the PCR test says it doesn't detect viruses or infections or illness. The PCR tests were set at 40 cycles. The error rate at 35 cycles is 97% false positive. He says that the more cycles, the greater the false positives. 30 would be a max to ever be used. A DNA test, if you, he says, if you do it well, can find anything and anyone. This is why we have false positives and why people with no symptoms test positive. <laughs> so I have a whole sheet on him. And, um, the other thing was that. And so back in um, to mass, when we were told in February and March of 2020 by Dr. Fauci that masks don't work, he was telling the truth about the science when he said that. Because in 2008, he wrote a paper on Spanish flu and 
1918. And he said most of the deaths were not from the flu, but they were from bacterial pneumonia caused by wearing masks. So he said, so he went against his own science and his own work. So his children are more risk of, of um, no more risk of COVID than the flu. And they'll be harmed physically and mentally while wearing masks by serving no purpose. So now that everybody knows the facts, I hope that people can just maybe go to the DBS. You're going to cut you off here. You're wrapping up great. If not, I'm going to cut you off. That's fine. Thank you. Do you want me to take these into the record uh, at formal documents? You can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for listening. I'm, I'm glad, I was glad to hear that everybody is basically on the same page. <laughs> Did we have one other person who wanted to speak or no? Um, I have one. I have one more on online, Denez. They, they can. They can wait till the people in place. But... Uh, they can go. I'm just. I, I have to erase some things that she just talked about. I don't want to. <laughs> All right, Jen. What do we got? Everything. Um, we know the case rates for each school per the MPS website. Is it possible to be shown data for close contacts that end up becoming positive? No, I, right now between everything that we're doing, I, I don't know where, what the intent of that data. Ultimately, would they're saying um, it would help to show if the spread in schools is happening. Yeah, answer's no. I mean, the fact of the matter is um, we, we have two situations thus far this year that we quote, may consider an in-school situation. But again, the details of where these things start and, it is what it is. What we try to do is if a student was positive and then they happen to be sitting next to a close contact and then that student becomes contact with a close contact during the school day, then we trace that back as being a uh, situation that happened in school. But again, it's main. I can't factually say one way or the other that I think it's 100%. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Gina Argentitas, 207 Bay Road. Um, I just have a few questions and a couple comments. Um, one being in regards to that social emotional learning. Um, and I was just wondering if you guys could elaborate on what's being taught or what will be taught. As Dr. Bayetta did mention that there will be, that will be addressed somehow. So I'm wondering, um, I want, I would like access to that and requesting access to the curriculum being used or what will be used um, at each grade level for my personal review and um, where can I find that material. Um, skip over a few things. Also, quickly, I just wanted to comment about the vaccine clinics um, in, in general um, and why are they taking place during school hours. Um, a school is a place for learning, not for medical procedures or anything like that to be done. That's my personal opinion. I do keep my children home on those days. With um, On what days? On the days that you guys have like the flu vaccine or whatever was done in the past. We've done the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine has been here in the district for years. I understand um, that, but I'm just wondering we, why it's being, I mean, it's not relating to like the mask or the COVID shot, but just generally speaking, I heard you guys talking about um, more clinics and stuff like that. Just wondering why it is being done at school um, during school hours. Well, the, the flu test has been done per permission of parents only. Um, so that's an individual parent choice to allow for it to happen during school. Um, that's not all parents. So if you don't want it, you don't do it. It doesn't impact your child. And the COVID, the COVID testing has not been done during uh, the, excuse me, the vaccinations for COVID have not been done during school time at all. Okay. And back to the flu. I do understand that I need you need consent for that, but mistakes do happen. Um, and I don't feel comfortable sending my kids to school when medical procedures are taking place at school. I just wanted to make that aware because sure. they are missing time sure. on learning. Sure. Um, and in regards to the COVID vax, um, so vaccinated students don't need to test and stay but they can still get it and spread it. So I'm asking um, for vaccinated students to be including in the test and stay procedure. Um, is this something that the school committee uh, would support? Um, actually, Fauci and the head of CDC publicly stated that the vaccine can't prevent transmission or infection. Um, the vaccinated have the same or higher 
viral levels than the unvaccinated, they should be included in the test and stay program too. Marshfield actually just changed their policy to reflect that information. I'd have to look into it. I don't, I don't, uh, it's my understanding through the protocols. I'll verify tomorrow, but uh, right. it's a DPH and DESE um, outline. It was actually shared with all families online or sent to all of you. It's a packet and it has the actually scenarios in it um, that were sent out before the start of school. Um, happy to send that to you again as well, and I can ask that question. Uh, yeah, I do have that. I'm just wondering why, like the CDC and Fauci, like the big. You know, people are well, giving I think, them guidance and we're, it, it's just, it doesn't make sense. So much of this does not make sense. Well, I don't disagree with you on that. I agree with you 100%. So let's go back for a couple on a, on the same type of situation without um, prolonging this for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, CDC and DESE originally didn't agree on three feet and six feet. There are recommendations, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at air quality testing, there are recommendations, not requirements. If you look at um, yeah, air exchanges in school and the recommendations, not requirements. They're considered best practices around when you have 24 kids in a classroom, you have 30 bodies in a classroom, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just another, what you're bringing up is yet another example of feds versus state and state decision being, let's do this through their department. Everything that we've gotten has come through Desi and the Mass Department of Public Health. Okay, so if Marshfield has changed it, I mean, I'd have to would that be it. would that be something? I know you'd have to look into it, but would that be something you all would be interested in considering? I think there's a difference specific. between if they changed it and if their change was approved, because a change like that would likely have to go through Desi and the DPH. So they, we as a school committee, could could make the change, but it might not get approved by the state, which governs how we put the program into place. So, I mean, I, I, I just, I don't want to say like, I just don't want to hear like, like a blanket statement, like, you know, this town changed it. That's fine, but it doesn't mean it was approved and allowed by the state. Okay. So is that something that you guys would look into? And I just had uh, um, a meeting with the Marshfield superintendent interesting yesterday. He's a dear friend of mine. So I'll reach out to him tomorrow. That sounds great. I'll be looking okay. forward to that update. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Jen, do we have any other questions online? No other questions. Okay. That is going to conclude the open forum. And does anybody, the school committee, have any other business? No. Okay. Uh, next meeting is going to be Thursday, October 28th, right here at the middle school, six o'clock in the library. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, Kathleen Stern. Yes. Carolyn Gallagher. Yes. Sherry Cohen. Yes. Dan Sheedy. Yes. Danette Savas. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Good night, everybody.